today we're talking with Catherine Lord. Catherine is the award-winning author of There's More to Books Than Reading, More to Organising and More to Mealtimes. Coming from a teaching background with a master's in education, Catherine has been a nanny all over the world. On the playground, parents and other nannies would ask her what books she used and what activities she did. And that's how her first book was born. She won an award for inspiring creativity with children in 2017 and was invited to New York by Nanny Circle to receive an award for exemplary work in the nanny industry in 2019. In 2021, Catherine opened her business, More to Organizing, and launched her second book with the same name. She won Organizing Coach of the Year, Best Newcomer of 2022, and supported even more families to organize with children in mind. She has spoken on stages for the International Nanny Training Day, Child Care and Education Expo, Nourish, and the Home Educators Conference, and is set to speak at the Ideal Home Show. Featuring in magazines such as Living ETC, Home and Gardens, Newspapers and Radios, Irish and BBC Radio, she has also been paid to write for The Times. Her third book, More to Meal Times, launched in September 23 and won a Creative Play Award in November. Catherine is passionate about bringing learning to life in the home. So thank you for being here, Catherine. We we are delighted to learn more about organizing and how it helps children learn. Could you share your background and experience in organizing rooms and routines with children in mind and what initially sparked your passion for this area of expertise? Yeah, of course. So I've been nannying for 10 years now and obviously I've been organizing children's playrooms and I've been organizing the bedrooms and I've been doing the laundry and all of that. But before that, I was a teacher so I was doing enabling environments, it's called, and there's lots and lots of theories about it. Um, so it's about the areas of learning and how to help your children thrive. Um, but I also, during lockdown, got a little bit obsessed with the home edit and um, with Marie Kondo, um, to the point that I actually got myself an interiors therapist. She's called Suzanne Roynan, and she came in and she supported me to declutter my own things and, and think about my own life. Um, so I started applying that to the, my nanny families that I had and mm. I actually did a diploma in decluttering and organising nice. and I found that the children's the children started thriving but also the parents' lives got easier and mine as well. <laughs> Fantastic and can you tell us a little bit more about this diploma? How do you how do you train for it? What what does it entail? Uh, yes, so um, it was an organising diploma um, and it helps you through organising and decluttering and all the different ways you can do it. There's also a Marie Kondo one as well. So mm -hmm. you, you sign up um, and you send in, uh, you've got to answer questions and send in how you've done it. But I think the reason that I can apply it to children is the en enabling environment section that yeah. I've, I taught, I was taught. Um, so I've got a degree in education. Um, I've also been teaching for six years before I was a nanny. Fantastic. And what, what are some of the fundamental pr principles for creating organized and child-friendly spaces within a home? And how can parents and nannies implement these principles to support the well-being and development of the children in their care? Um, so to for children, I think the most important thing is helping them become more independent, more self-sufficient, but also support their self-esteem, which is by helping them learn for themselves. But it's also about choices. Um, even an adult wouldn't like to be told what to wear, what to eat, when to do mm -hmm. stuff. So all those things, giving them choices and making them feel like they're in charge of their own everything, autonomy, mm -hmm. um, will make them feel more confident and um, happier. Um, and part of that is organizing height so if, if things that they need are at the right height then obviously they'll they are going to be more independent because they'll they'll have the things that they need right there um i also use color a lot so i know the home edit use color coordination but i use it for an entirely different reason your children know their color of their favorite book before they can even read so if it's in color coordination then they'll be able to find it but they'll also be able to put it back so it empowers them to know where it goes um, the other thing that I also do is rotation, which is a lot of theorists, theorists do this already. Um, so by rotating the toys, which means there's not too too much out at once, 
-hmm. it means they're more purposeful in their playing and they're learning with those resources another thing that i do is themed boxes so rather than having one box full of jigsaws that's not actually going to entertain them for very long and all you'll end up with is a thousand jigsaw pieces that you need to organize and tidy up at the end of the day which is not what we want to do let's pretend it's dinosaurs and i have actually organized themed dinosaur boxes and lots of different theme boxes but um if you have uh small world in there so little dinosaurs mm -hmm. and have a jigsaw about dinosaurs in there but also put an activity book in there that has dinosaurs in and a reading book in there about dinosaurs they're going to use that box way longer and be more entertained because there's so many different things to do on that theme and then you just switch out the theme I do really like to use the children's interests at the time mm -hmm. Um, and they change, obviously. I wouldn't say yes. keep that box there forever. Switch it up. Um, and obviously, you can go back to it. And there's no reason why you can't overlap your dinosaurs in your train set can overlap for more um, imaginative play. Um, so I also tell everybody to add reading opportunities and organic writing opportunities within all the areas of your play. So if you have got a home, um, like a kitchen, Mm -hmm. then add in a notebook um, and a little telephone um, and let them be able to write shopping lists, re recipes. And they're ob an obvious one. But I think if you have a construction area, so with your Lego, add in like designs. So then they can pretend to be builders and designing their own um, their own houses um, and annotating it. And there's so many other amazing things that you can do as well um, with any so like with the dinosaurs obviously you wouldn't be writing dinosaurs but you could add in pictures of dinosaurs that they can label so then you've got mm -hmm. a reason for them to write and it's organic and they're more likely to go to do it than if you never ever have it available for them fantastic and do you feel that the children who are exposed to like these theme boxes that you're talking about are more are less prone to say I'm bored, I'm bored, because they've got something that they can actually go and get and keep busy with. Absolutely, because there's way more to entertain them in there. But it's it's not even just about entertaining them. It's about offering these opportunities for um, more risk, more play, more it's them that's choosing to use their imagination on how to use those things and so I was going to talk about this later on but open-ended options mm -hmm. and having invitations to play are the reasons that your children will less likely to say I'm bored because there's yep. nothing to do and um, if um, it's actually I have a client um, and she's got all these boxes in it's in her conservatory and she sent me them all over and she said my children have so many toys but they don't play with any of them. And I said, have you ever set out an invitation to play? And she said, well, no, they're just in the box. And I said, well, your two-year-old doesn't know that they're in that box. Bring it out and mm -hmm. show them how to play with it, model how to play with it, play with your children, and they're more likely to be excited and be involved and less likely to say that they're born. Fantastic. And so do you explain all of these things in the books that you have written or yes. these things that you do as a consultant? Um, absolutely both. So the, in my book, I'm here, more yeah. some organizing. I absolutely talk about all of that. And as a consultant, so I do online consulting, but I also do in person in England. Um, I go into their homes and I organize it for them and help them declutter and make sure that um, everything is. I am. Um, I don't say age related. I say developmentally related because mm -hmm. it's obviously depends on the child. Um, so then they've, they've got the things that can help their children thrive. Okay, fantastic. And for, for children who are neurodivergent or have unique needs, what strategies and accommodations can be implemented in their daily routines and in their spaces that they use? Um, so it's extremely important that you know the child very well. Obviously, as, as a parent, you will, and as a nanny, you also will. Um, I actually um, was asked by the, uh, the editor of the... Uh, SEN magazine to write a blog on pathological demand avoidance and how to organize for that um, and ironically I did a lot of research and I and I did write the article with her and then I ended up um, becoming a nanny for a, a mm -hmm. child with pathological demand avoidance so oh, wow. I, not only did I get to research it I got to to really support and understand um, and with that it's reducing uncertainty um, 
with with pathological demand avoidance or other other SENs as well, um, um, avoiding sensory overload is really important. Mm. We've got to think about auditory, um, and obviously visual is really important, but um, lights as well. That's some things that we might not think of. Um, and minimizing rules, especially for pathological demand avoidance. Um, obviously, you do need some boundaries for safety there, but if you can minimize the shoulds and should not, and always have a plan B for yourself. Um, it's really important to allow more time for anything that you're going to do. Um, and setting up a quiet area is really important for them. So then they, they can use that to keep themselves calm. Um, I also talk a lot about decluttering your language um, mm. with your children all the time, um, especially in my second book, The More to Meal Times. But um, in this case, with pathological demand avoidance, it's not saying you, um, you must do this or you have to do this. It's actually thinking about your language so then they don't feel that it's a demand on them. And time cues for transitions, are, I think, are important for everybody, um, but even more so for our children that have ex um, extra needs. Fantastic. And for, for <laughs> listeners and viewers who don't know what the pathological demand, demand avoidance is, could you explain that like in simple terms? Uh, okay, yes. Yeah. So it's, um, it's children and adults um, that um feel more anxiety when they have demands put upon them um yes so it can be quite de debilitating yes i'm sure and it must be really really hard if if like you said if somebody's always asking them to do something or inviting them to do something and they don't mm. have that space where they can feel safe yes yes um can parents and nannies access any resources uh, either online or books uh, to further their knowledge and skills in creating organized rooms and routines tailored for children's needs. Obviously, you have books and we will link those in the description. Um, but are there any other resources that you're aware of that would be something parents and nannies could or should access? Uh, yeah, so other other than my blogs as well, so I've got more to organising and more to books blogs, which I've got lots of free advice for parents on there. Um, I advise looking up Froebel or Steiner or Montessori is a big one. Um, they're, they're just the theorists behind all this and they've got lots of years of experience. I, I believe you take what you need from each of those, not not all of all of the theories I believe work for all the children and um, so I think it's really important to read around it and find the things that work for your family. Fantastic and do you have some stories that you can share some success stories that um, yes. improve of how the organization of an environment has improved or or a routine or a meal time um, has improved and positively impacted a child and their family? Yeah, definitely. So I've actually got a, a long term family that I've been decluttering for. Um, so I know their family through I was a, I was their tutor at the beginning. So I, I'm a child who needs that extra support. Um, and then they asked me if I could help them organize the space that she was learning in. And because I knew her, I could do it really effectively. Mm. Um, but I was taking away the distractions um, and making it more welcoming and arguably more exciting. Um, so with with certain children they don't want to sit down and learn they don't have to sit down and learn um, I think that's one of the most important things to think about um, there's a way to learn that may be different to how people think is the standardized way yes. um, but also what I did with that room was I created a space where she knew exactly where everything was so rather than the learning be um hindered by not being able to find the pencils and the pens so this child was seven um I actually created a space so that that bit was all sorted for her and it was easy and then the the tricky bit for her which was the learning could could happen without all the other stuff that was in the way yeah um I also organized their bedroom um for independence so what we did what I did was create spaces where things that they wanted to have you know like their clothes their underwear their socks their pajamas were all in a space that they could access themselves and they could have choice over um I think the the, the key for me is the children having the choice because mm -hmm. I think that's really important but also the children having the accessibility um, and the environment where it's okay to get things wrong and it's okay to learn from mistakes um I think that's really important 
So do you, when you, when you do these decluttering sessions and organizing sessions, are the children involved in any, in any way, or is it the parents asking you to do something and you coming up with a solution? Uh, sometimes both. So it obviously depends on the children. I think it's really important if you can to start as young as possible. Um, so I do do declutterings with young children when we premise it, especially before birthdays and Christmas, to say these can go to some other children that need them more to make space for new toys. Um, um, I think I've also been advising an adult who has a child who they're worried that she's got a... Um, uh, hoarding tendencies mm. um so th- in that sense i haven't done it with her although they started what they've started to do is hire me as their ad hoc nanny so then i'm getting to know the child and the child is getting to know me and then when it comes to the point that we're going to start slowly getting rid of things then i know the child really well before we do it i think that's the really important thing with all of this is you need to know the child you need even yes. when i'm doing declutter decluttering for adults I need to learn the adult, learn what they like, learn what they don't like, um, and learn how to support them the best way they can. Fantastic. Right. And, <laughs> and I'm assuming with adults, you you do that by just talking with them and asking them to fill out questionnaires. Yes. So um, when, when I'm doing an online or an in-person one, mm-hmm. I always have a, a video call beforehand to really learn about them. But Many of my clients hire me again and again and again. So, but like I get to know them really, right. really well by the end, uh, which is amazing. Um, but also any adult that I ha- like help support who have children, their la- the children's lives are impacted by the adult organizing their space. Mm. So you wouldn't have to start with the children's space. You'd start with the adult space. And once they like find a way for themselves children do tend to copy so my nanny family that I do I have a nanny family in the afternoons and without me prompting because I've been doing it for two years the children have organized all their bobbles in color order so then it's easy (laughs) to find um they really love organizing I've done their lego but after that fact they they've just got these little boxes and they've organized even more so um without me telling them to um, so it is really modeling. Modeling is really important. Fantastic. Well, thank you for all of that information. Now, <laughs> if the, our listeners and viewers want to purchase one of your books or want to book a consultation, how will how can they do that? Uh, so they can do that through my website, www.moretoorganizing.com. Um, but also you can get the books on Amazon. Uh, but if you get them through me, then I can do signed copies for you. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here and sharing all this with us. And uh, we will see you soon. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome.